love that piece. Scenes from some of the best movies of 1982, which we'll be talking about on the special edition of At the Movies. These are going to be some of the best movies according to me, and also some of the best according to the man across the aisle from me, Gene Sisko, film critic of the Chicago Tribune. And this is Roger Ebert, film critic of the Chicago Sun-Times. Now, it has been quite a year. I could have filled my best ten list three times. I had 30 films that I thought qualified, a record for me, and the public seemed to agree. 1982 was the best year at the box office in the last 30 years. And more adults came back to the movies. And while young people are always steady moviegoers, last year, according to the Gallup poll, 14% more adults went to the movies drawn back by enormous across-the-board hits like On Golden Pond, Rocky III, and the movie Roger begins with on his best list, E.T. The name of the movie is E.T., The Extraterrestrial. And in no time at all, everybody knew that title stood for a lonely little visitor from outer space who was stranded on Earth millions of light years away from his home and who became the special friend of a little boy. E.T. itself was a creation of special effects, but the best effect in the movie was its sense of wonder, its ability in a cynical world to be astonished and delighted by the possibility that life isn't just limited to one small corner of one small solar system. Here's the scene just before the movie's humans get exposed to that idea. Come back again, Mom. Okay, party's over. Everybody back inside. Yeah. Quick, turn up. Tyler, give me that knife. Oh, great. Nice one, Elliot. It was an accident. A pizza. Yeah. Accident. Who said you guys could order a pizza, huh? Uh, him. I, I, but huh? In the house. You geek, man. Great. My mom, it was really nice. Don't douchebag talk in my house. the most famous entrance in the year's <laughs> movies. Later on, of course, that small boy becomes the good friend of the small extraterrestrial. And if there was one element that really made E.T. work as a great entertainment, I'd say it was the imagination and accuracy with which it got inside that little boy's mind. Mm -hmm. E.T. wasn't a science fiction movie so much as it was a memory of the fierce attachment and loyalty the kids have for pets and for mm -hmm. playmates, and if the opportunity presents itself even for alien beings. Mm -hmm. By the end of the year, E.T. was being written about as the biggest box office bestseller of all time and as a merchandising phenomenon, but E.T. was also a real good movie, and I put it third on my list of the top ten. That's where it is on my list, too, and I think you're quite right. A boy and his dog story is the mm -hmm. key to understanding mm -hmm. this. And boy and his alien. Right. Mm -hmm. And I uh, also think, you know, people want to know, what does the Steven Spielberg, the director of this film, have that makes him so special? And I think he understands one thing very well, the drama of setting your world in the beginning of a picture mm -hmm. quite real mm -hmm. low-key you see it in jaws you see it in close encounters his pictures you see it here again mm -hmm. you see it in poltergeist too suburbia ordinary people the details are right what's in the refrigerator the right mm -hmm. products what the kids say is all right and then you can accept mm -hmm. something wild happening. ordinary life surrounded by the unknown and the opening in the scene that we just saw mm -hmm. here for example the foreground near us mm -hmm. is all dark Right. Then you have that kitchen table with a light over it. Right. Not that the whole kitchen is lit up and nice and warm and safe, but that just outside the family circle is this whole universe of possibilities. Anything can happen, and we look forward to yeah. something wild happening. Yeah. My first selection of the year's best turns out to be number seven on my list, and it's personal best, the story of a young woman growing up in the world of Olympic track and field competition and learning the meaning of love and friendship and competition. 
personal best got a lot of attention last February when it was released because of its sexual frankness in a lot of the nudity in the shower scenes seems appropriate. <laughs> and also some scenes of sexual fondling between the two lead female characters, Mariel Hemingway as a young athlete on her way up and Patrice Donnelly as a veteran athlete who takes young Hemingway under her wing and into her home. But their life together is not without quarrels. After all, they are competing for spots on the same Olympic team. Oh, God, can we just go work out? Do whatever you want. That's just it. I can't. I can't stop worrying about you. What about me? What you're thinking. What you think I think. What you want. Everything. I don't know. So? You worry about what everybody thinks. Why should you be different with me? Hi! Come on, you guys. Either you move out or I move out, and we really are just friends. One of the most exciting elements of this adventurous film is the way it celebrates women's bodies in its track and field sequences. Personal Best is the first film directed by Robert Town, one of Hollywood's finest screenwriters. Chinatown, Shampoo, and The Last Detail are his great scripts. I guess what I like most about this film, and I think this is true of all of the pictures on my list, is the degree of risk-taking that this picture has. We feel like we're on slightly dangerous ground in Personal Best, entering into the lives of people dedicated to their bodies. Personal Best was personal and was intimate. I've seen it twice. I'd like to see it again soon. I liked it even a little bit more than you did. I put it fifth on my wow. list. And one yeah. of the things I liked about it, I was reminded again looking at this scene, mm -hmm. was the ferocious intensity of the emotions Absolutely. in this film. There's so much phony emotion mm -hmm. on television in a lot of movies where it's all this conflict involving violence between cops and robbers yeah. and so forth. Here the intensity was that they were fighting against themselves, fighting against excellence and against their own idea of perfection yeah. and their own personal best. And yeah. then, of course, the love relationship. I think that the, these real. two performers, though, get a lot of credit, too. Mm -hmm. Patrice Donnelly, Mar Mariel Hemingway, two very natural, low-key people. Mm -hmm. I hope they both keep making a lot of movies. I'd like to see Patrice Donnelly's next film. Okay. Next at the movies, the French thriller that became one of the most popular foreign films in U.S. box office history. The RCA video disc player. No other video product in history has sold more in its first year. Just look at why. <laughs> RCA Video Disc Player lets you see great entertainment on your TV with a remarkable picture and now even stereo. Players start at $2.99. So why not get more out of your TV? We'll open your eyes, RCA. Did you brush your teeth yet? Math test tomorrow. Can't help you with metrics. I thought you knew everything. <laughs> hey, I do about some things, like cavities. Oh. I know you could get even fewer than I did. How do you know that? Because I know Advanced Formula Crest has fluoristat. So? Compared to the Crest I grew up on, it's even tougher. The homework's tougher, too. <laughs> Quit worrying. You always make Mom and me real proud. With Crest, your kids could have even fewer cavities than you did. Sore throat? Say, ah. Chlor, ah, septic. The ah in chloroseptic is for fast, temporary relief of minor sore throat pain. Chlor, ah, septic. Doctors and pharmacists have been recommending chloroseptic for over 20 years. When your throat hurts, say ah. chlor septic Liquid lozenges and children's chloroseptic. Fast relief for sore throat pain. Ah. Glad has come up with a way to really handle kitchen garbage. With these, tall kitchen garbage bags with handles built right in. Glad handle tie bags. This tough, puncture-resistant bag has handles that you can tie in a knot, so no more twist ties. And the handles make it easy to lift and carry. Get a handle on your garbage with Glad Handle Tie Bags. Yes, we're number one. We're tough, and we're glad. When an unknown French director named Jean-Jacques Benex opened his first movie a couple years ago in Paris, not many people went to see it, and not many critics liked it very much, because who was this guy anyway? But the French movie that the French didn't like became one of the most popular foreign films in U.S. history, and its name was Diva. We have a sequence here showing the film's technical mastery 
in a chase scene through the Paris metro system. That scene is a reminder of the sheer exuberance of mm -hmm. motion in the movies. And one of the best things about Diva was that the movie wasn't afraid to throw in everything in its plot except the kitchen sink. In fact, the kitchen sink did make it in, and an inspired little scene about Zen Buddhism and the art of buttering bread. The movie was also about a great opera singer and a corrupt police force and a French prostitution ring and two stolen tape recordings and a mysterious man who seemed to pull everybody else's strings. Diva was a movie of great style and energy and good humor, and I put it second on my list. And it was number four on mine, so we mm -hmm. both really liked it a lot. And I think the exuberance is the key here. I mean, you came into this, I didn't know anything about this movie when I saw it, and you, I came in there, and it's alive. Mm -hmm. And I think it has to do uh, with the director. First-time directors mm -hmm. will really throw everything in. He was just right out of the gate. This yeah. guy had been the assistant director exactly. for the last ten years for everybody from Claude Chabrol to Jerry Lewis. Right. And all that time, he must have been thinking, what will scenes. I do when I get my hands on a movie? Just storing away scenes and camera mm -hmm. angles. And, you know, great characters. It had two chases, not just one. Most movies are about one thing and one character. This had two great chases going on at the same mm -hmm. time. Lots of subordinate characters, supporting characters that were interesting. Two parallel criminal plots. Great. Mm -hmm. Just loved it. Yeah. Well, my next choice is Tootsie, which finished number two on my list, because Tootsie is a great piece of American commercial movie making. It's a good, intricate story, a big star, and a memorable performance, lots of laughs. And we also walk out of the theater happier and a little wiser. You probably know the story by now. Dustin Hoffman plays an out-of-work actor, so desperate for a job. He dresses up as a woman and, without telling anyone, pretends to be an actress and auditions for a role on a woman's soap opera. Okay, Miss Michaels, we're going to do a little... Very good line. <laughs> and nice direction there, because you see, by showing all the television monitors, it gives us a chance to inspect Hoffman as, uh -huh. as his character. It's really good movie making by Sidney Pollack. Well, Hoffman, as Miss Michaels, does get the job, and doing so, I think he really reveals to us the exquisite pain that young actors suffer just to get work, any kind of work. The script also reminds us a thing or two about sexual role playing, and above all, Tootsie is great fun. I suppose I'd rather laugh at the movies than just about anything else. And Tootsie made me laugh the most in 1982. I think Hoffman did something in this movie that not many actors could have done. Not only did he make a character that we identified with to begin with, a young actor is out of work, yes. but he makes this woman Absolutely. into another character. No not question. the first character in drag, right. but a second character, a woman. And then also, of course, because he is able to move in this disguise through the world, mm -hmm. as you pointed out, we get all of the insights into what... Uh, the woman's world looks like to a man. It's interesting. You know, uh, a lot of people want this character to come back, and they're talking to Hoffman about making it a sequel. He had a great line. He says, well, I suppose in the next one I could conceive. You know? <laughs> great. <laughs> Coming up next, my choice and Gene's choice for the best movies of 1982, and I don't think we agree. And now for number one, my choice for the best movie of 1982 is Sophie's Choice, an ambitious and emotionally charged film that took a real chance by dealing with two different tragedies in two different countries at two different times. The character who connects the two tragedies is a Polish Catholic woman named Sophie who lost her family in the Nazi concentration camps and who in this scene has escaped from those camps and somehow made her way to a Brooklyn rooming home where she falls in love with a brilliant madman and utterly fascinates the young southerner downstairs who wants to be a great novelist. Yeah, when I was a little girl, I... I remember I lay in bed and I hear my mother downstairs playing the piano and the sound of my father's typewriter. I think no child has a more wonderful father and mother. And a more beautiful life. That's Meryl Streep as Sophie in a wonderful performance. Even while she's entering into the laughter and the romance of the story set in the present day, she still contains memories of the time just a few years ago when it seemed to her that love and laughter had disappeared from the face of the earth. And it seemed to me that Sophie's choice was about the fragility of love. It was a reminder that disaster can strike us not only from the outside, from an evil political system, 
but also from the inside, from the treachery of our own hearts. I don't get the treachery of the hearts bit. I also don't agree with you that this film's that good either. Well, I'll explain the treachery of the hearts. Here's a woman who has not only been destroyed in spirit in the mm -hmm. concentration camps, but she's lost her family in an incident that makes her feel so guilty that it's necessary for her to fall in love with a man who's going to destroy her. And well, she knows that. Yeah. Well, my problem is that I thought that this whole character, the man that's going to destroy her, was very poorly developed and mm -hmm. not particularly well played. And that's this guy, Nathan, that's behind her on the piano there. And uh, as a result, I thought that the movie, most for me, was just a sad story, mm -hmm. uh, beautifully, played by, story. beautifully mm -hmm. played by her, but gaining a lot of its interest from the fact that it is a Holocaust story, and as a result, almost easily is going to make us feel very sad. And that, to me, was about it. It didn't have the, 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 the epic quality I found, that I found in the book when I read it. I was, that's that's why I didn't make my list. That's very strange. I totally disagree with you. It mm -hmm. seems to me that this is Sophie's story, and because it's Sophie's story, you mm -hmm. can't just dismiss it as being one more story about the Holocaust. No. Well, it's I a can't, specific story yeah. about a person. Yeah, but I, again, I just found these other characters not supporting her as well as I found in the book. That was, we disagree. Okay. Critics often pick little foreign films over the big American films on their ten best lists, sometimes as a way of helping out the little picture, even though they may legitimately think it's better. Some people may think that's what's going on with my number one choice as the best film of the year, which is Moonlighting, an English film made by a Polish director, Jerzy Skolomowski's film. But Moonlighting had to be my number one selection. This movie gave me the most joy as a piece of filmmaking, and credit for that goes to writer-director Skolomowski. The way this film moves along is spectacular, telling a very simple story of four Polish laborers working illegally in London. The leader of the group, the foreman, is the only one who speaks English, providing everything these men need, from food and shelter to entertainment. Can I help you? Nice set, sir. Only 50 pounds, very cheap. It's 40 pounds, that's all I have. No more. 40 pounds, fully guaranteed, 26-inch color television set. Sir, I can see you have a nice sense of humor, but please, let us be serious. Forty pounds out to guarantee. Cash. Forty pounds. No guarantee, no aerial. Forty pounds without the guarantee and with the aerial. <laughs> tough bargain. It's tough to survive. This is a real survival story. That was Jeremy Irons as the foreman. You may remember him from the French Lieutenant's Woman. Moonlighting can be enjoyed simply as an adventure film with these men at work under a tough boss who is trying to survive the best he can, stealing food out of the supermarket for his workers and for himself. And it also can be enjoyed as a political statement about the way being a boss is intoxicating and how all political societies control workers, capitalist societies with money, communist societies with outright fear. I felt sorry for the worker in this movie, but I also felt overjoyed at the filmmaking of their story. Moonlighting is a great film, I think, that will last a long, long time. That's why it's my number one choice. It's also on my uh, top ten list, and I liked it, too. And, you know, one of the things I liked about it was that it was about, and we say this over and over again on At The Movies, about specific people having a specific experience. Mm -hmm. There are so many formulas that we see in the movies, and also on television, mm -hmm. so many movies where you can see the first ten minutes and know exactly what's going to happen. And this one came right out of left field. That opening scene, you don't know what it means, and then it goes right on from there. And they're there. building a house. All the while that these uh -huh. characters are building, they're building a house. And uh, the next time I go to London, this is how much I love this movie, You're gonna go i got to find that house, and I want to <laughs> walk around inside of it because this movie literally literally created a whole world. Are you going to shoplift a frozen turkey down the street of the supermarket? I think I'll skip that part okay. of the movie, all right? Next, we'll come back and look at both of our complete list of the 10 best movies of 1982. Look at me. Do you like what you see? Good. Because it's not me. It's a recording of me on Nimrex videotape. This remarkable tape has been recorded and re-recorded 100 times, but I bet you still couldn't tell if it was Nimrex or me, which really isn't me. It's Memorex, Memorex videotape. Even after 100 recordings, you'll wonder, is it live or is it Memorex? Okay, we've looked at some of the year's best films, some on Gene's list, some on mine, some on both of our lists. But one thing that Gene and I do not do is collaborate on a single list of the year's best films. No way. Gene has his opinion, I have mine. Gene, why don't you go first? Okay, I'll start from the bottom of my list and work up. 
In the number 10 spot, Taylor Hackford's an officer and a gentleman with Richard Gere, Louis Gossett Jr., and Deborah Winger. Number 9, Das Boot from West Germany, the World War II submarine adventure story. Number 8, Francesco Rossi's Three Brothers from Italy, a study of the fragmentation of modern society by studying three brothers mourning the death of their mother. Robert Towns' personal best is number 7. I like the movie's definition of competitive excellence, trying to do the best one can each day. Number 6, Rainer Werner Fassbinder's Lola, a modernization of the Blue Angel story set in 1950s Germany. Number five, Isfan Sabo's Mephisto, about an actor selling his soul for fame in Nazi Germany. Number four, Jean-Jacques Benek's brilliant French film debut, Diva. Number three, E.T., enough said, it's on its way to becoming the top grossing film of all time. Number two, Sidney Pollack's Tootsie, more than the year's funniest film, it's a sly comment on sexual role playing as well as a celebration of the pains and pleasures of being an actor. And number one, the best film of 1982, according to me, Jerzy Skolomowski's Moonlighting. Four workers from Poland building a house in a film that builds a strong case against oppression of workers. Deeply moving, and at the same time, great joy in the filmmaking. Well, starting with my number 10 film on my list, I chose Wasn't That a Time? The joyous documentary about a reunion by the legendary folk quartet, The Weavers. Number nine, Sidney Lumet's The Verdict with a great performance by Paul Newman as an alcoholic lawyer trying to regain his self-respect. In eighth place, Moonlighting, the movie about Polish laborers stranded in London. My seventh place movie, Mephisto, had a brilliant performance by Klaus Maria Brandauer. Sixth place, Das Boot, the claustrophobic German thriller set on the submarine. Number five, Personal Best, the movie about two women athletes. Number four, a double selection. Werner Herzog's Fitzcarraldo, a film about a mad dreamer obsessed with the notion dragging a steamship over dry land, and then Les Blank's documentary Burden of Dreams about Herzog's film and Herzog's own obsession with doing the same thing. In third place, Steven Spielberg's E.T. about the year's unlikeliest playmate. My second place movie was Diva, the stylish French thriller about opera, prostitution, and Zen Buddhism. And in first place, my choice for the best film of 1982, Alan Pakula's Sophie's Choice, starring Meryl Streep, Kevin Kline, and Peter McNichol in a battle between romance and self-destruction. That's it for the year's best movies. Join us next week when we'll look at the other side of the coin, the stinkers of the year, films we'd like to give one last kick to. That's <laughs> next week, and until then, we'll see you at the movies. Promotional considerations paid for by Ward Johnston, Johnson Wax, and Super Pop Popcorn. Hooray for Raisinets. Now you can enjoy one of the all-time favorite movie candies at home, Goobers and Snowcaps, too. Hooray for Raisinets. Glade Aerosol, the air freshener that instantly makes your home fresh. One spray and you'll know the difference Glade made. Super Pop Popcorn, a tender, delicious, nutritious snack at an economical price. Super Pop Popcorn, it's the one snack you can't eat alone. Super Pop.